Okay. Good to go. All right, welcome everyone. This is our weekly meeting of the Long Range Planning Committee. We have with us today board members, Dr. Ron Clark and Ron Dunworth, and we have staff Bud Hunt, Casey Lanzinger Pierce, and Katie Meserly, who is facilitating the facilities planning process. Uh, on our agenda, we have two items today, and I will turn this over to Katie. All right. Well, just an update on old business, the public input sessions. Those will be held on the 23rd and 24th and everything should be going live within the next hour or two. So we'll have that information going out to the public and we'll be hitting it hard through a variety of channels. So watch your own calendars because um, I'll be putting the dates on your um, library calendar as well. Uh, and then I'll send out links to where folks can sign up. So that way, like Kendra had mentioned last week, I would encourage you to send them out to your network or share on your personal social media pages. The more people we can get involved in the public input sessions, the better. So hey, who's gonna be hosting be... that meeting? Oh, excuse we me. Will be, we will be hosting the meeting. We, as the committee? as in the library. Okay. So the way we see it, Ron, is depending on how many people register, when we go into breakout sessions, we'll have a facilitator in that breakout session and a board member in that breakout session. If we get lots and lots of people, we might have another staff member to be a note taker because uh, it's hard to facilitate and take notes without like not you're not looking at the people then, you're looking at your notepad. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll depend on how many people register. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Katie, that, that will be our main form of public input. We're not gonna plan on putting like a survey or any comments, like putting it on the website and asking for comment in any way. Okay. Nope. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're not gonna do anything for folks that can't attend. Basically, if you, you can't attend, that's that's your avenue to provide feedback. Okay. Yeah, because Sorry, I, that was just the yeah, same question. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, because um, I think without the context of the kind of um, background information and the data portion that we're sharing, I don't think the recommendations yeah. make sense on their own without understanding a bit about the context. Okay. And so I think that they need to go hand in hand. Okay. Yeah, I don't disagree. That's it. Thanks. Any other comments for Katie about the public feedback? No. No. All right. On to new business. Um, the draft report uh, after last work session, uh, I followed up with um, all of the board members as discussed in the meeting. I have received um, no comments from any of the board members besides Ron and Kendra. And well, Ron, Ron and Kendra. And so you guys are on the committee. Um, and I've also had no one reach out about their availability and I've followed up once since then. So um, if you could encourage your fellow board members, particularly those that are on the long range planning committee to provide their comments and schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings so we can go into more detail about those. That would be greatly appreciated. So can I restate that? The only people you heard back from were the three of us on the long range? Yes. Okay. Um, I think I gave you a phone number to give me a call. I'd be happy to arrange a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Yep. So. Um, I figured we probably all already had an in-depth conversation throughout these committee meetings. And so unless I discuss this with both, I think with Kendra and for sure with Kendra, but I think Ron, we had exchanged an email or perhaps I hadn't pressed send yet. Um, but I feel pretty comfortable knowing your, your thoughts and opinions um, throughout this working committee. But if you feel otherwise, I'm happy to sit down with you. I really wanted to give the other board members a chance to have some dedicated time to talk through anything. Hey, Ron, Ron, Ron Clark. Yeah. 
by the way, I, I reached out to you last night and left you a message. And uh, I mentioned to Anna, I was trying to get a hold of you to give you an update of our Thursday meeting that you couldn't attend. And right. she, she gave me your cell phone and I called it and it was this morning, just before this meeting. I know we're three hours different, so I didn't want to wake you by calling you at eight o'clock my time. Just to maybe uh, give you an update of what uh, the board meeting was about and share that with you to kind of get you up to speed. So yeah. if you want to if you want to talk later, let me know and I'll I'll well, go back over my could, notes. Could you kind of bring me up to speed now? What what went on at the work session? Uh, I can, but I think it would be kind of a waste of time for the other four people, maybe, because uh, they've already gone through it. But I'll call you right back and do it. Is that okay? I. I Okay. I'd like to what went on at the at the work session. No, I'll be I mean, glad to do it. I'll, I'll share my notes and my impressions and uh, did we present uh what did what did we talk about at the work session? Was a we went over life, we went over the life. same plan we did uh in the Wednesday session. Yeah, uh, in light of we, the new data, I would have I was wondering what discussion might have ensued with the new projections that showed that our reserves pretty much bottomed out in eight years. I, I think uh, that came later, but the reality is that, and I'll just share this with you but so we don't have to tie everybody else up. I, I think we will use reserves, but that's what reserves are for. Uh, we have reserves of $3 million in the long range building structure already. Uh, I, I think the information that we got and put into the plan is very, I would say, uh, worst case scenario. And it was built that way. Typically, I'm used to having a county do a worst case, best case, and I try to figure out where it's in the middle. So I, I think, uh, although it looks like it's reserves going away, I think we are in a good position financially and fiscally to move forward at least to make a determination what the real numbers are. And that's kind of the messaging is everything we put in there is worst case, uh, the devil's gonna happen and uh, we have to put some uh, real spin on it and we have to get some advice from some true financial people, banking industries who will take a look at our information and financials and tell us, yeah, this is good according to you know, standards. So that's, that's kind of the crux of it. We talked a little bit about uh, uh, the uh, mobile library, you know, the bus. Uh, and uh, we pretty well shelved that for later on in the meeting until we get past this primary decision on the short term two to three year plan. So at, a, at the work session, did we make did any recommendations to the board members that were there? Yes, you made the recommendations as outlined in the plan. We did. Yes. Yep. Even though the data has significantly changed, our recommendations stay the same. Were these recommendations made by the Long Range Planning Committee or individual committee members? That was the consensus that I received via email when I sent out the revised data as soon as I realized that error. It was both, I think. Mm -hmm. The consensus and the individuals. Even though we haven't really discussed things as a committee with the new data. We, that seems, um, it would seem like our recommendations might need more dialogue and perhaps some change based upon the new information that we have rather than just going on with. And that's why I'd asked via email if you wanted to postpone and the results were that no, there was not a desire to postpone and have further dialogue, that we wanted to proceed with the recommendations. My recommendation was, and I shared it with everybody on the Long Range Planning Committee, is to move forward. And that quite frankly, the new numbers as Carrie showed them track closer to what I was doing on my own spreadsheets. So I, not that I don't, well, I don't trust anybody. Not that I didn't have faith in Katie's numbers, but I well, like to do them myself and so I think I was tracking more to what the net result is after the correction than prior yeah. to that. As I, I understand. I think the, there's an important thing to note, Dr. Clark, 
that when you're looking at the projection graph, the county um, really only projects out five years at a time. So we took year five and used that number to project out from year five to 10. And that is, that is I believe, one of the root causes of where um, it starts to give the appearance that we'll have uh, expenditures exceed revenue in years five through 10 because of that. So each year that we move forward, we'll have another year of data to be able to project further out. That's the best that we can gather with the Well County Assessor's data. And if you'll recall with the Windsor Severance Fire Rescue Model, um, which we used for the other set of projections earlier on, um, we did have more, I'd say positive numbers in the years five through 10. So if, if, if it were me, I would use both of those models to be able to kind of um, find an average, so to speak, of what you could realistically expect. I think no, that's as, I understand, as I understand it, the change was because we did not factor in uh, staff projections for a branch library. Is that correct? I did not realize that when I had created the worksheet calculations that my formulas had not copied over. And so what was missing was the addition of a column that included the additive staff and operating expenses for the, for the three additional projects. But so, as I remember at our last meeting, I specifically asked that question because I noticed that our expenditures were linear and that it didn't, to me, factor in increased staff costs, but then I was assured that that had already been factored in. Are you telling me, as a matter of fact, it hadn't been factored in? Is that correct? That is what I am saying. And I believe that it was because it was in my spreadsheet, but I was in the wrong in that the formulas were not tying that column in. So- Well, yeah, I'm looking at the, at the new graph that you sent out and, mm -hmm. you know, when I see that our reserves markedly continue to decrease and bottom out, I'm thinking, you know, reserves are for situations that you don't count on. You know, some, I kind of a believer in Murphy's law, you know, that something can go wrong, that it, that it probably will. And in construction situations, that seems to be, you know, fairly common. It's not like we have a, a one capital project going on. We've got three. So the chances of needing reserves seems to be paramount to me. And therefore, I think that we need to kind of reassess where we're going with this situation. I can't see that we can function with our reserves completely bottoming out. What would we do if we, if we were in the middle of a construction process and, and it, we had cost overruns and we didn't have the reserves to cover it? And I would encourage you to watch Thursday's work session because there was discussion among the board members about that, about the need to not deplete reserves, about the need that if we were to, if it were to look like there was going to be a budget shortfall that we would do some um, hard fiscal management in order to maintain fiscal solvency. And also that this is a starting point, I believe were Kendra's words. This is a starting point for budgeting purposes that ultimately the next steps should we proceed would be to firmly establish a budget for each project and the scope. So this is a starting point. Okay. Ron, did I miss anything from from that conversation or misremember anything from that conversation. I did put the link, Ron Clark, in the chat in case you want to access the video recording and catch up on Thursday's presentation. I think you did due diligence and because your formula didn't work, that's, I like that because it validated that my numbers weren't that far off. I think so I'm seeing some 
some relative sameness, if you will, the way I computed it and the way you computed it. So I feel good about that. I still feel good about the fact that we are erring in terms of the budgetary issues on the side of caution. And also, Ron, in terms of reserves, one of the biggest reserves for $3 million right now is labeled long-term building. So I think, although we call it a reserve, we don't sit on it. We are garnering that money in order to apply it to a long-term building project. So I, I think we pretty well labeled everything. If you look at that, we, we have other reserves still there. Plus we have a property that's worth over a million dollars. And if we needed to in the future, because we do look at that as an asset, we, we could uh, liquidate that. So I feel very comfortable moving forward with this. Well, it has to be liquidated in about 2026, according to this graph. Potentially. We'd only have a million dollars left at that point, And I'm assuming that million dollars would probably be the, our green spar property. <clears throat> Now, Which the reserve one? balance does include the purchase price of the land. What's that? So that? The reserve balance includes the purchase price of the land. Right. I understand that. But that's only part of the reserves. We have a cash reserve, too. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that, uh, for instance, a starting point. Let's say when we talk about a starting point for the branch library in Severance, what how do we proceed with that? What, if, uh, what? How does that work? Where do we go with that? So if the board approves the plan, then the next step would be to hire a owner's rep. Um, we would put out an RFP for an owner's rep. The owner's rep then works with us um, and puts out an RFP for an architect and the board decides which architect they feel is going to do the best job in designing a new building. And then uh, along with that comes a contract manager at risk, which then works with the architect and the owner's rep to make sure that we stay within our budget guidelines, that we don't go over you know, our $6 million price. Um, and, and then becomes a building project where you have a committee and the architect brings back ideas to the committee and the committee decides whether that's what you need. That's where you bring in the public to say, what is it you want in your branch library? What's the most important things to your community? Um, and then ultimately you break ground and you start the project. So, okay. you know, there are always gonna be, you know, cost overruns in some areas because building materials, the prices fluctuate. Um, but you, you try to keep it on track with what you said you were gonna spend for the overall project. And yep, that's pretty much it. It's the owner's rep who works on your behalf to negotiate with the architect and the contract manager at risk. Um, it, it, yeah, you're it's a leap of faith that everything will go well, but if we're gonna loan the money, the money's there to pay people. Our responsibility is to pay back the loan and make sure that the building gets built. As far and as, yep. Isn't, isn't there a line item for overrun expense in the budget? On There's the, usually, on, there usually is in the planning, that they build in a number. Um, there's, there's, I was gonna say, there is a contingency number built into each of those project number. costs right now. So there is, there's an assumption million. that there'll be a percentage overage in each of those projects. Yeah, so it's not staying within the budget, it's staying within the budget plus the contingency dollars, That's which right. I think is close to a million. Yeah, it's, it's the rainy day or the Murphy's Law that, that Dr. Clark was talking about. Each of those projects has a Murphy's Law line item in it, essentially, and there's room. And we believe that there may be cost-saving measures if we have the same architect work on all three projects, and we still could pursue getting permit waivers through the town of Windsor, and we could pursue grant funding through DOLA, although we should set our expectations that that likely won't be a significant amount due to the demand that DOLA has been facing for grant money. And we have options of working with our friends and foundation to see if they want to engage in capital fundraising campaigns. So our conservative projections do not include any of those additional avenues for pursuing funding because like Ron mentioned, these are very conservative 
and potentially worst case scenario projections. How about a, asking for a mill levy? That, was that can, would be a consideration? That could be a consideration. I would personally not recommend that in the immediate future, but it may be something that if the, if the projections continue to play out in a worst case scenario manner, that, that may be an avenue you want to explore three, four years down the road. It's not an immediate need, I believe. In, in addition, the school district is coming out for all 170 plus million mill levy this year. The fire department will be coming out. So our chances are negligible. And with our track record of our last two mill levies failing, I think it would be 99% against 1% for. And secondly, Paul, um, uh, what's his name? Brock Meyer, our, our Meyer. Water, he, our, thank you, our uh, mayor, in a meeting we had with him, Kendra and I, he uh, was not for a mill levy now. He said in four to five years, and this is paraphrasing his quote, he would support a mill levy to apply to operating costs, not building costs. And I think with his support and also the same for the mayor of, of uh, Severance, I think we'd have a very, very good chance at that point of a mill levy passing. So I, I think we're good on the monies. I think we're good on the loan. And the last point I'd like to make is that Time is of an essence. It's, it's very important that you realize that right now, interest rates are lowest they're ever going to be, and that's going to change, and they're going to go up. Uh, right now, uh, there's money available to be loaned, and uh, the interest rates on that money is, is, is very low. Uh, and construction, and, and costs, con and construction costs are continuing to go up daily. So um, it's now our... What would we... What would we do if we found out that our construction costs increased significantly and that we looked at our reserves and found out that we didn't have the re reserves to cover those construction costs? What would we do in that case? My opinion is we would stop and we would reassess what we're trying to build, reconfigure the building down in size or make some hard decisions. I mean, we're targeting a 10,000 square foot library and if you remember, we reported back that the mayor of Severance is talking about a $2 million tin building in the build in the beginning. So I, I think Severance would work with us in, in coming up with the appropriate size that made sense based upon our fiscal capabilities. And we make that adjustment. And I would suggest to you, maybe it'll go up because I think taxes are going to go up. Assessments are, are going to go up. Uh, now that Gallagher's out of the way and we're going to probably see more revenue coming in from the private side of the construction world you know, versus the commercial side. So uh, I, I don't think it's quite as bad as people seem to think. Uh, oil's going to come back and go. I bet you we're paying $4 a gallon at the pump by the end of the summer. It's already up to almost $3 here in Windsor. It continues to go up daily. So, um, but to your basic question, if, if it looks like the numbers come in and we can't afford it, we as a collective group make a decision to either hold on the project or modify the project to a level we can't afford and go from there. I would offer the recommendation that perhaps we add some clarity to the plan draft in that regard. So we, we make sure that it's noted that the board, you know, number one, providing additional clarity and context behind the projection graph as we've discussed, and then also make sure that it's part of the recommendations, both long-term and short-term, um, that uh, that basically the budget remain in the black. Um, how do you guys feel about that? Plus, there were some small comments from Bill in the email chain to the board that I would like to address in the plan. Well, the thing about making a comment that the budget stays in the black, we can't do that because we are going to go and use reserves. We're not going to use all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what we want to do is we want to say, here's the downside, but here's what we would do. T to that point, if we suddenly the construction costs come out now after well, well above our calculation, what does the board do? The board makes a decision whether to go forward whether to modify the build or whether to cancel the build. And I think that's the kind of thing that you could put in the documentation because this is not a one shot, here we go and uh, we're set for 30 years. This is a three year project with three components to it. And if the first component comes in too high, we make a decision. We build less, put it in line with the budget. 
we allocate more budget and cut back on the other two projects. Uh, we, we make some kind of accommodation that makes fiscal sense for the library. I mean, I don't want to destroy the library. I want to grow it. And I want to show fiscal responsibility in doing that. But Frank, even though I'm not, you know, Frank made a comment, you know, it, we need to do something. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something well, I remember in the community. A, a few weeks ago, Ann mentioned that if we were going to build a branch library in Severance, we're going to have to have a mill levy. And I'm thinking she's right on target. I don't think you're, I think you're wrong. I absolutely think you're wrong. We don't have to have a mill levy. Well, that's, we just have the I, that's just what Ann, Ann Fling said. So I'm just repeating what she said. I don't think that's. And no, my phone was ringing. All right, sorry. Um, we will I, eventually need a mill levy. I, I don't think we can continue to keep growing and building more things and hiring more staff, but I don't think we can ask for a mill levy right now. I think we have to show in good faith that we want to grow our, our libraries, our district, our services. And then at some point we have to go back to the public and say, if you want to continue, we need an operating mill levy. Um, but right now going up against the school district with the massive bond that they're gonna put on the ballot in the fall and with the fire district already having voters approved an increase every few years, we would never be able to win. Um, and, and so we need to show that we're doing our best and then at that point, yes, you can't keep growing on a 3.546 mil levy. You have to have more money than that. I think all three of us have said the same thing. We will need a mill levy, yes, but it'll be an operational mill levy in four or five years. And the cities have bought it, the towns have bought into that at the mayoral level. And, and hopefully the school district would support us at that point too, to say that, you know, education is important beyond the classroom. Um, and that for our libraries to continue what we do for the school district, you know, a mill levy for the library is in order. Um, right now, I, I highly doubt that the school district would support us. Not that they don't value what we do, but right now it, they need all the money they can get to expand the schools. Well, I, I, you know, I, I worry that we'd be half, halfway through a, a building project for a branch library and severance, 10,000 square feet. And all of a sudden we find out some untoward event happens that we need more money and we don't have it. I mean, well, that's what the contingency is for. That's built into the project costs. And one of the next steps would be working with an architect and an owner's rep to be able to detail out the scope and the project costs. And part of that project cost is that dedicated contingency fund. Have you looked at the construction costs on the severance plan? Because those contingency dollars are lined item in there and I don't have it up, but I thought it was around a million dollars in contingency. Um, there's not a construction project here that I don't believe has that baked well, in to some degree. It's, does, a, it it's a percentage, but yeah, that one's line item. Yeah. Let me hold on. Let me find where that's at. I think you know, as someone said, we would before we would we would certainly you know say to the architect then if we can't do ten thousand we need to scale it back. You know, maybe it goes to 8,000 if we don't have the money. Um, you know, at one point, you know, there was an option of the town of Severance perhaps loaning the library money at no interest. I mean, you know, maybe that's an option. I mean, there are things that we will have to face as we move forward. And I'm sure we'll figure something out. Do you have it, Katie? No, I'm not. Finding it. See if someone can beat me to it. I'm not 
seeing where he has put it in here. Uh, owner's pre-construction contingency for the severance branch is 15%, which is 550,000. Also within, I just noticed this, but um, he did, Dan did include an automated material handling system at 150,000 for the severance branch. So there is some, some wiggle room, you know? $700,000 if you take those two things. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put one of those in the severance branch. And there's the possibility of doing one at, at when, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's room there. The other thing we have that we've sort of talked around is we've assumed that we'll continue to grow staff at infinitum going forward. And we're going to start doing that in 2022. Um, that's not necessarily something we would need to do. And that gives us a lever as well. It's yeah. room, it's a cost. It's not a thing we'd want to do, um, but it's a thing we can do without. Well, it's a thing we can do. Based upon the information, Katie, that you gave us with our reserves continually to decline, in fact, bottoming out, do you, does it seem like we might have a little trouble borrowing money? We I would think or they would, they would question that. We've already, we've already talked to Stiffle about that. So we've already had had initial conversations with Stiffle. That would be one of the converse. We, I mean, one of the action items, as discussed and outlined in the plan, is to put out an RFP for a financial provider. And every indication when Stiffle reviewed our numbers, they did not seem to have an issue with loaning up to eight million dollars. And in the projections we have outlined, we have outlined a for assumption purposes, a $6 million COP. Well, that was based upon the previous graph that showed our- No, 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 that was based, that was based on Stiffle looking at our current balance sheet. That was not based on, that was not based on any projections, anything like that. Stiffle took a look at our numbers. That's right. I mean, that they didn't, they weren't counting on any charts or graphs that we came up with. They looked at what we have in the bank, what our trends are for revenue, what our past revenue has been, what our current budget is. They were looking at the whole package and they felt comfortable saying that up to $8 million uh, would be doable for us. That's a stretch in my opinion. The 8 million mark is a bit of a stretch but they felt comfortable with that. And so, you know, that's independent of any graphs that we would have produced. Katie, I pulled up the copy I've been working with and I showed that the owner's pre-construction contingency, which is Zion construction and bid is $1.15 million in the Dan sheet. The, the one, the document that Katie and I are working with was from a, uh, February 23rd that Dan uh, Spikestra sent to us. It was a spreadsheet that he did just before we were gathering all of our final numbers. Yeah, and, uh, it's, it's labeled CLD-2021.02.0. Clearview building budget options. Hey, well, the sheet that I'm working with was the one you sent me originally, Ann, from 2017 that we moved up 15%, and the numbers kind of track. So, um. Dan redid it, giving us his best estimate for you know this for the current time. So we can send you that one. I thought we had sent you that one, but we can send you that one. It's yeah, I like to I like to compare it to the one I had originally because. The bottom line numbers come to be get to be pretty close to each other. So I just emailed that to you again, Ron. Okay. Thank you. You are welcome. Um, at the work session, did did was there discussion on the two other projects we're talking about? The Humphreys Racial Reimagination Project and the Ash Street Property Project. Was that discussed? Yes, it was. 
your your recommendations were presented in full. Excuse and me. The recommendations were presented in full, both the short and long term, as outlined in the plan. They were provided Rec a draft of the plan. Recommendations based upon previous data, which we found out is flawed. So it seems to me like those recommendations just might have changed. And that is why I had emailed you. And consensus via email was to proceed. I voted. Proceed with, proceed with to, the meeting. To, to proceed with the work session and with the recommendations as set forth in the draft plan. Well, I am not in favor of the recommendations that are in the draft plan. So that was an error. <clears throat> I think it was an error that I expected, not expected, but validated my data and I feel comfortable moving forward. So I guess we vote on it. Well, yes, there'll be a vote on the entire plan. Yep. At the either the April 29th meeting or we can hold a special meeting if we don't want to wait that long. Um, to make a decision. So we can we can always call a special board meeting to vote on the plan earlier in April. But we do need to go through the public comment period and we need to get feedback and then incorporate it into the plan and before we have a, a meeting where we actually vote. And Ron, did you wanna share, Ron Dunworth, did you wanna share any of the feedback that you heard from your fellow board members about the um, administrative hub and or the renovation of the library. There was very few comments overall. I felt as if the tone was very supportive and very um, excited. Brian was incredibly excited. He felt that the amount of effort we put into it and going forward, he was uh, excited to go forward. I felt that um, Rochelle was the same way. And she did raise the question about the, the mobile bus or, you know, the bookmobile and we talked about that in general and told her it's all the strategic plan long-term target but to focus back on this and she was happy that uh we felt we could go forward and uh, and frank was happy and frank was very happy i thank you for that <laughs> and i specifically asked scott uh and uh he's a very large entrepreneurial businessman and uh, he didn't see any big surprises other than good work I believe his comment was something to the effect of um, leadership is making a decision. And now that you have a decision, that's that's half the battle. <laughs> yeah, I have to I shorten that to just good work. But yeah, he did say that. <laughs> Frank felt that I think Frank's comment was that everybody is in the same boat. Um, all the fire district the towns, the library district, we have growth, we need to accommodate it. And it's, you know, there's a risk involved, but everyone is taking that risk because we need to take a risk. Like I pointed out, there's a risk anytime you borrow money for 30 years. And, and that happens thousands of times a day, every day when you buy a home. There's no guarantee you're going to be able to pay it off. I mean, other than track record and what performance data you could put together about your future. Um, so uh, I, I think worrying about the long-term future is, I, I think uh, Brenda Drones kind of summed it up. We don't go out that far because nobody knows. I agree with that. I think that there is risk and that's what reserves are for. As and, a steward of, of public money, I feel like that uh, that's why we have reserves to mitigate against the risk, the exact risk you're talking about. And I don't see that being the case in the scenario that's presented. The exact risks I am talking about are long-term and, and we have long-term funding in those reserves specific for running a library and also for building a building. And I think we're well positioned. Of course, a bank may tell us different. So until we ask a bank, we really don't know. But the stifle people seem to think we're in a good position financially and going forward to even borrow more money than that. So um, deferring to the experts, I'd say let's, I haven't changed my mind. I think we made the right decision and we should move forward as quickly as possible before the financial picture changes and impacts us. Interest goes up and the cost of materials continue to climb. 
So time is of an essence. The more we spend discussing it and worrying about, you know, the sky that's not falling, uh, the, the more expensive it'll be. And Anne, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the board's approval of the plan isn't indicative of a blank check. Like we're not, that's correct. Saying, we're not saying essentially, you know, board, please give us a blank check for, or a, a check for $9 million and let's, let's go. It is the board will, the, this is the path that we want to pursue. If things change, prices, funding, availability of certain properties, et cetera, we will evaluate that because each of those decisions, for example, purchasing an administrative hub will still require board approval on an individual basis for allocating that sum of money and, and signing that contract, correct? That's, That's correct. correct. Everything so will be a separate piece, you know, going forward with an administrative hub is a separate piece. Um, you know, the renovations at Windsor Severance, they'll be tied in because as we said, there's economies of scale by having one architect, one owner's rep, um, not having three separate groups that you're trying to work with. But each one of those steps along the way will require board approval. And so. And, and in about a thorough, because the estimates presented are very high level with a lot of assumptions baked in. And the next step is to get into the nitty gritty and really say, this is what we can afford. This is what we actually 100% want to do or not do. And then, then, then it goes before the board the, the actual budget numbers and, and cost proposals will go before the board to, before executing. So it's not a blank check. The only thing in front of the board or what we plan to present to the board is the approval of the general plan. It's not a specific component. And without that approval of the general plan, it's very hard to engage vendors to define it or finite it down to a point to where we can come back to the board and say, here it is, let's sign a contract or here it is, it's too expensive or our budget was off 50%, so we have to go back and do something else. But we, we, we have to go forward and we just can't sit there and watch dollars come into the reserve fund and, and hope a building miraculously appears. We have to take some action. None of it is definitive and long lasting until we get to that point and everybody will then be able to vote to whether or not to pull that trigger. Right now, we're just looking for a general approval of the plan, the short-term plan, which is build severance, buy ash and then uh, upgrade the current library if we can. And we'll modify that if we need to because of financial restraints or because ash gets sold or severance changes their mind. I mean, until we have this go ahead to continue that exploration in a more finite approach, we can't do anything. So talking about, you know, cost overruns now without knowing what the costs are is doesn't do any good. Anything else or? Katie, do you have any other, anything else on, there's nothing else on the agenda? Nothing else on the agenda. I would just encourage you to encourage your fellow board members to send us their feedback. Read the plan, make comments, mm -hmm. set up How a one-on-one. -on -one, um, we, excuse me? How should we, as board members, uh, do our comments? How should we do that? I have included instructions in the email that I sent out after the last work session. So either folks can send an email to the long range planning group email and or they can meet individually with Ann and I one-on-one -on -one and we'll gather in-depth feedback from them. I think if you limit the one-on-ones to Katie to answering questions so they can make an informed decision, I mean, that'll be helpful. But again, it's too early in the game to worry about the end sum result until we understand what costs really are, what we're gonna pay for ash, renegotiate it to. It's, you know, best we can go with is what we have. And I think the, the team did a yeoman's job in putting those numbers together and uh, problems develop when you're dealing with technology as far as those kinds of numbers and there's too many to understand them. And, um, and I take full ownership. It was my error that I did not catch and I 
thought everything was in, but the formulas weren't linked. And so that was not an intentional error or omission on my site, my, my, my side of things. And I'm sorry if I led you to believe otherwise, it well, was it completely unintentional. If you did anything intentional, it just, it just changes the whole scenario in my mind. You're right. And so that's why as soon as I discovered the issue, I emailed you out all directly since we didn't have time on the calendar to solicit input right away. Well, I appreciate the fact you had the error because I thought I was the stupid one when I ran. <laughs> well, hey now. And it validated, and it validated, you know, that at least two people can run different spreadsheets and get kind of close to the same results. And I think the results that I was anticipating were fully, you know, acceptable. And then when I saw your results, I was, I was going to buy ownership. Um, but <laughs> we're, we're good. I think we're good. We're as good as we can be, Mr. Dunworth, at this point in time with the knowledge we have to make a decision. That's, that's um, all we can hope for. I mean, this team has gone to great lengths to try to get us as close as we can. And at the end of the day, it's still a 50,000 foot level view. Now we need the board approval so we can start getting down into uh, real things, real numbers. And we have until the April meeting to continue to refine the language in the draft plan. However, the long range planning committee wishes it to read. My preference would be that we do have a, a special meeting in order to adopt the plan and yay or nay it. And then so we can have the authority to start talking to people on Ash Street and start talking to people in Severance about some kind of, of a uh, uh, interdepartmental inter uh, agreement, so that they call them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we need to get that out of the way because again, I, I can't say it enough, we're up against a timeline. Money's cheap right now, construction costs are going up. And the longer we wait, the more expensive it's gonna be because one of those two factors or maybe both. And then we may shoot ourselves in the foot by missing that window. Katie, I think it's obvious that I have I'm probably the one that has the most serious concerns. And I guess my question is, how is it, how is the best way for me to uh, vocalize my concerns to the, the rest of the board members and the committee members? How, how should I do that? Um, well, you can voice your concerns right now. You can voice your concerns at any of the upcoming long range planning committee meetings. You can voice your concerns um, at the final, um, essentially the final presentation of the, of the plan for approval to your fellow board members. You could email the long range planning email if you have specific thoughts that you wanna share, especially oh. if you're not here. Um, Anna, am I missing any mechanisms through which he could provide feedback? That would be you know in writing through email um or even you know on paper and mail it to Kendra or to me at the library um and all those other avenues that Katie discussed okay but you mentioned I could a few things now regarding the, the severance branch I I to me that's the one thing that we really should focus on mm -hmm. uh, that's the one thing that we've had uh, uh the, the city of Severance, has, town of Severance has been very proactive. And I think we should bend over backwards and do whatever we can to make that happen. I think we have two choices. One is to, you know, to plan and go forward with a, a 10,000 foot library that's a good branch that provides good services that we would be proud of. And then depending on how much you know we think that's going to cost decide whether we can afford it or not if we can afford it fine if we can't then i think we have two choices one is we can ask the voters to approve it i mean if you would think that that severance voters would come out in hordes to support something like this for a, a mill levy increase if that's really what they want and the second option would be to to tone things down, make it a smaller branch with less facilities, less staffing, and be able to 
complete the project without depleting our reserve significantly. As far as the, well, those are the two, two scenarios. I prefer the, the, the first one, building a branch that we're proud of and going to the voters if necessary. As far as the uh, Humphreys ratio designs, every time I see it, it's for 100%. And I've never been in favor of going, doing everything. I've been in favor. That, you'll notice in the plan that that is not the case. We took out the bookmobile garage. We, we took out the renovation of the bookmobile garage, which was a 200 and some thousand dollar project. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was removed because no one felt that we needed to have the teen space in the bookmobile garage. And uh, it's, it's actually better That's to keep the bookmobile there. So we took that part out uh, and then you know prioritized all of the other things in the order we thought was necessary. Um, and so once again, those numbers are very preliminary, but there are contingencies that were built into that proposal too. But until we have actual numbers, we can't even make a decision or actually we need the architect and engineers to weigh in on what makes the most sense for if you touch one thing, what other things need to be touched or, or what needs to be done first. And so we can't go any farther with that until we actually bring someone in who's an expert and starts to actually draft the plans for what we want to do um, and have an owner's rep sitting right next to them saying like, okay, that would be ridiculously expensive. Let's look at some other options. Um, so it, we're, we're kind of, as Ron Dunward said, at a standstill here until we approve something and move forward and can hire the people that we need to help us make the financial the decisions on the plan that'll impact our finances. We, we but, can make the decisions. We just need the finite data that these professionals will provide us with. Because right now we're still dealing with general data. And when we get, and that general data says we can do it. But until we refine it, discussing the size of severance or the rework on what, on, on third street or buying ash it, it's it's it doesn't do any good other than where we're at right now let's figure out what it's going to cost us to build severance which we could get started on if we you know if we have approval and let's figure out what it's going to cost us to buy ash we don't have to buy it we just have to know what it's going to cost and let's figure out what it's going to cost us to renovate you know third street well, as you probably know, the Ash Street project has been the one thing that I've been pretty adamant against, um, mainly because I just don't think we have the data. We have two pieces of data. One is that Humphrey's ratio said that we very likely will need to provide offsite that there will need to, that 10 of our staff members will need to, to work offsite based upon their plans. One piece of data. The second one was that when we discussed it, and we thought if in fact we provide offsite space for our staff, we probably should allow 300 square feet per person. Those are the only two things we have. We haven't talked about any types of sharing. We haven't talked about any use of home. We haven't talked about different aspects, who, what, how many, nothing. But we've been on a real estate binge here for the last year, looking at real estate, when I don't think we have near enough data to know what we're talking about. Ron, if you I remember correctly. But I've, been, I've if, never have been able to get it. I asked Casey, uh, Yep. You've asked me multiple times and I provided you with that background data and that that analysis of the sharing space was done as part of the feasibility study with with ratio design. And so that was evaluated on what positions could be shared, what couldn't, what could be worked from home. That has been evaluated and that was built into the assumptions that were placed forth in the recommendations by Humphreys Poli or ratio design. So it wasn't in, in, in the ratio design proposal, it wasn't 
likely that we needed, it was if we wanted to renovate, we needed to move 10 people out of the building in order right. to do the renovations that ratio was proposing. It was, we do need to, and if we wanted to use the garage, we would have to find space for the bookmobile. So, but it was 10 people needed to move if we wanted to move forward with renovations. I think and the renovation it, word should be maybe if we wanted to increase library service space. Right. And I think that's the ultimate goal of the design and moving the people out is we end up with more service space to serve the patrons. That's what part of Ash Street does. It, it, yeah, it does. It does. It makes it so that the children's area at bigger. the Windsor Severance Library is bigger and where there's some defined spaces for the kids to hang out, which they don't have right now. And so to do that, we need to relocate staff um, and we can't fit all those staff on the other side of the building. There's no way. As far as working from home, uh, I attended a employer's council where members of employer's council, which is a large group of their advisors, there's attorneys and they have libraries and they have special districts and they have private industry um, as part of their membership. And they did uh, last Thursday, a uh, mini conference and one of the things they talked about was working from home. And so they've surveyed employees that are part of their membership and they've asked employees, how do you feel about working from home? And when things go back to normal, would you like to continue working from home or do you believe you need to have office space? Most of the people that were surveyed by employers council said that they would prefer to be in the building two to three days a week. So there were those people like Brad Vogler who works for us and is our person who takes care of our website and, and technology needs. Brad would be more than happy to continue to work from home. He doesn't believe he needs to be in the building at any time, but other of our employees can do some of their functions at home and then they need to be in the building for their other functions. And so right. that fit along right, really well with what employers council found when they surveyed employees that people didn't mind doing some of their work from home, but two to three days a week, they needed to be in their, their place of employment. Yeah, and, and we, did, we did that um, staff survey. So another data point that if you recall, we did a staff survey back in October to basically confirm the work that management had done with Humphreys Pulley three months three-ish months before about analyzing the shared versus work at home versus 100% um, dedicated desk. And it aligned with what management believed. It also aligns with this employer's council survey. So we had multiple data points and we've shared all that data with you in previous work sessions and in previous committee meetings. Okay, Katie, and, and I'm sure you have, and I'm sure I've neglected to digest it. And, but I still need to be satisfied with it. And I have a feeling that when I get back from vacation, you and I are gonna to have to sit together and go through this in detail because I, I'm, uh, I'm sure you've shared it and I've missed it, but somehow I'm gonna to have to be comfortable with it. Um, and I'm happy to do that. Just let me know when you're back and when you'd like to meet. What's that? Just let me know when you're back and when you'd like to meet. I'll get, I'll get in touch with you when I get home. <clears throat> All right. Is there any other business or can we conclude our meeting for today? All right. I call the meeting adjourned at 2.01 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you all.